for this title. And he's got to go to Middlesbrough and get something. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Love it. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of The Warm Down Today. I am delighted to be joined by former Manchester United chairman Martin Edwards. Martin, you was a board member for 10 years, you was the chairman for 24 years, I think, 20, 23 years. Yeah. You oversaw Manchester United coming from a sleeping giant to an actual giant. World champions when you left. What an incredible journey. Thank yeah. you for joining us on The Warm Down. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So, if I can answer any questions. so we've, we have got a few questions. We spoke to some of the readers and we've got a couple of questions. Well, let's start right at the beginning. The first thing that we want to talk about then is you oversaw the transition from Sexton. Yeah. You was a young man when you had to fire Sexton. Yeah. And obviously then Ron Atkinson and into Fergie. What was that like? Let's go back right to the Sexton days. And um, well, that was uh, are always difficult when you've got to make changes, particularly with a, the with a, a new manager. And I was new to the job. I think I was with my father died in... in uh, February 1980. So I took over at the back end of that, that, that season. So I had uh, um, Dave Sexton for a few months and I had him the full season the next season. And he'd been with us for four years. And I just felt that, that, that we were a long way off actually winning the league. Although we, were, we weren't in a bad position, we, you know, uh, league wise, we were performing okay. I just felt that, that the, the football wasn't that exciting and that I couldn't see uh, the league on the horizon. So I just felt that you know the, the, the fans were also saying it by voting with their feet because uh, gates were going down, uh, they weren't enamoured with the football, so uh, decided to make the change. And of course then Ron, Ron came in. So you just mentioned Big Ron, and uh, Big Ron had a relatively successful period, didn't he? Just prior to Sir Alex coming, we had a couple of cup finals, we was finishing third and fourth in the league, we had a, a brilliant start in 11, we was this close, like, what really made you the decision that you didn't think Ron was the right man? Well, I think the, the, the season before, you're quite right, the season before Ron went, uh, we'd had that tremendous start to the season where we had the 10 wins and we were playing really exciting uh, football. Uh, but at the end of that season, I remember we played Watford away and I remember after the Watford game, uh, Ron approached me and said he, he thought that you know, it was coming to the end. From his point of view, he felt that, that maybe he'd gone as far as he, he could. And I didn't feel the same at the time, and I persuaded him to stick with it. Let's let's give it one more one more go. Um, but we started the next season in, in in poor form, and I think when we made the change, we were something like 19th in the league, mm. and we played uh, um, down at Southampton away in the League Cup, and we lost 4-1. Uh, plus that, plus being 19th in the league, I just felt that really, you know, perhaps he should have gone at the end of the. The, the previous season and that things weren't going to get any better that now was the time to to make the change. See that makes a lot more sense because I never knew that he himself was was doubting his own abilities but I think once a man doubts his own abilities there was a lot of rumours of Louis van Gaal had offered his resignation at the Christmas prior to him being fired right. and you think once you hear those rumours you're like if the man doubts his abilities how can anyone else have the confidence? Yeah, well, that also came into the thinking as well obviously with, with him saying that to me the, the, the previous season um, but, you know, to be fair to Ron, in the five years that he was with us, we played some exciting football. Mm. You know, we, we played with wingers, we had those ten tremendous games, we got to a couple of foot cup finals, we won them both. So he was far from a failure. Uh, you know, we'd had five good years with Ron, but I think we were going backwards rather than forwards. And we were never, we were always third or fourth in five years, but we always qualified for Europe. Mm. So in some ways, he certainly wasn't a failure, uh, but... We were after that championship, you know, seeing Liverpool every year winning the championship and all the rest of it. We wanted to win that, win that league. So after Ron, that lad did all right, didn't he, the guy that you got in? <laughs> How did the recruitment process go? Was there a shortlist or was it, no, there was no, no that's no, the man? No, not at all. Uh, I'd met um, Alec as part of the Strachan deal when we took Gordon, when we bought Gordon course, Strachan yeah. in Ron's time. Uh, we had a problem because Gordon Strachan had already signed the contract for Cologne. So, and we were... Uh, Aberdeen were going to get more money from us than they would for Cologne. Um, so Alec was keen for Strachan to come to us because it meant more money for him in the Aberdeen uh, kitty, as it were, the pot. So he was helpful to us in getting Strachan. So that's when we got to know Ron, that's when I personally got to know Ron. 
and Fergie. You know, sorry, Fergie. So with the success that he'd had, you know, I mean, when you think about oh, breaking the, the, like Aberdeen, the monopoly of breaking, Celtic and Rangers, uh, unbelievable, wow, yeah. unbelievable to win three championships and four Scottish Cups. But the real the real highlight was was beating Real Madrid in the Cup Winners Cup in '83. Yeah. You know, I mean, to go to beat Real Madrid in the final, a club the size of Aberdeen was quite something. So we knew that he could do it on the European front as well. And that was a major factor in wanting him as a, a Manchester factor, United manager. Major factor. So you. Um, how do you how do you go about recruiting him? Do you pick up the phone? No. Um, well, that was quite an interesting story because obviously I couldn't just pick up the phone and to Aberdeen to the secretary at Aberdeen <laughs> or, or the switchboard at Aberdeen and say this is Martin Edwards. Could I speak to Alec Ferguson? So um, it was Mike Edelson, one of our directors, who came up with the idea. Why don't I get on the phone, put on the Scottish accent, and say I'm Gordon Strachan's uh, agent or accountant or whatever else, which is what he did. And uh, it got through. Wow! And then, as soon as uh, I was able to speak to Alec, he knew obviously he knew me because we knew each other. I just said uh, that you know, was he was he worth us coming up to have a talk? And he obviously gave us the right vibes, so we agreed to meet that night. Was this pre uh, Ron being fired or? This was pre Ron being fired. Okay. Yeah. It was so it was time. kind of being lined up. It was yes, exactly. What I didn't want is because obviously when we got Ron, um, we'd had Laurie McMenemy lined up. And that fell through, and then we went for uh, Bobby Robson, and eventually we went for Ron Saunders as well. So in a way, Ron was like the fourth choice. Wow. Uh, so I didn't want to be in that situation again, where you're scrambling around, you know, having made a decision to sack someone, and then, then you've got to then find, yeah. find a manager. Uh, we wanted it the right way around this time. So you had three lean years under Sir Alex Ferguson, yeah. and there's the famous Tara Fergie banner from, from Pete Molyneux. Yeah. There's um, a little bit of crowd discontent. Now, I believe that you were saying a lot of the fans, but I've been told that I have to tell you today that it wasn't all the fans. There was a split, definitely, but it wasn't all the fans looking for Sir Alex to go. Um, what made you stick around with him? Because we'd finished... 11th, 2nd, 11th, 13th or something like that. Yeah. That feels like going backwards from, you know, cup finals yeah. and European football under Ron. Yeah, and when you say it wasn't a lot of fans, I was getting a lot of mail saying... Yeah, but the, what the, sort the, of dickhead writes mail? Well, yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but there was a lot of mail and there was the odd banner and there was odd, the odd abuse at games and all the rest of it. So there was, a lot of people uh, didn't feel that, that, that Alec was the right man. What made us confident in him was the way that he'd set about his job. Mm. The first thing he did when he came into Old Trafford, he said, why are Manchester, why are Manchester City picking up all the, the, the best youth players? And he looked at the youth team and thought, well, United's youth team is, is not as successful as it was. It should be more successful. City seemed to be recruiting more local players. So the first thing he did was to revamp the scouting system and look at that. He also brought in Archie Knox as his assistant. And Archie, the, the pair of them got involved in all the teams, not just the first team, the reserves, the A team, the B team, the youth. They were just involved in the whole running of the club from top to bottom. And of course, they did bring in a lot of new scouts. Mm. So, and don't forget the year that we're talking about now, the, the year of the Cup run, uh, 90, we bought five players that year. So we'd supported the manager in the summer in recruiting five new players. You don't bring in five new players and expect them all to just, you know, Far on all cylinders straight away. That's a that's a very important point when we consider the current state of affairs in the team, well, where takes, people just expect. It takes time for, for players to uh, to gel. I mean, I remember Pallister coming in; he wasn't an immediate success. Even uh, you were talking before about personally about Evera. I remember Evera and Vidic coming in; they weren't immediate successes. Mm. You know what I mean? It takes time. The the culture of United, the size of the club, everything else. Players need time. Need time. We'd bought five players in that season. They were betting in, and we suffered results. As a, as, a, as a result of bringing them in, we suffered a little bit. So we had to give him time to, 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 for those players to come through and show what they were worth, plus all the hard work he was doing. We never actually lost faith as a board. Nothing, ever. There was never a conversation. There was never a conversation between me or any of the directors, either informally or during a board meter, meeting, saying that he must go. But I will say that personally, I knew that time was running out because if, let's say, we'd gone that season and nothing had happened, we mm. hadn't had the cup run, we got to the end of the season, we knocked out of the cup early, and let's say we were poorly positioned in the league, the pressure would have grown and grown and grown. 
and at some stage we may have had to have done something, but we weren't we weren't on the verge of it. Yeah, because I think it might have been the eighty nine season. Uh, United and City was both hovering just above relegation yeah. for a period of the season, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, if we'd have been in danger of relegation and nowhere near in the cup, do you think that would have pushed you over the it edge? It may have done. It may have done. I can't say for definite, but it may have done. We'd have been under a lot more pressure. Let's put it that way. How much of that we'd have been able to resist? I don't know. Uh, do you think he would survive in 2017 under those well, circumstances? Well, I keep on getting asked that question. And, and, and I think now, with, with the, the way that the, the media and TV and radio and social media and everything, the way it's gone, I think the pressure is even greater today on managers and on boards of directors to make decisions. We've had a, a, a situation this season where a manager was sacked after four games. New manager, four games, he's gone. Makes I no mean, sense. It's, 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 you spend all summer preparing for the, the season and everything, and the, the signings and the pre season and everything else, and yeah. then four yeah. games into the season. So, so it's difficult to imagine that, 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 that with the pressure today. I mean, people also are say that, that if Alec Ferguson say had been, been, even when he was with us, in all the years he was with us, would he have survived as long with, say, a Bayern Munich, a Barcelona, or a Real Madrid? He might not have done because they look on success as winning the European Cup. Yeah. League titles aren't necessarily uh, the be-all and end-all to European clubs. Mm. They want to, 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 to win the European Cup every year. You know what I mean? We won two European Cups in 26 years. Would that have been enough to, to keep him in the job abroad? <laughs> it's all a question of, of, of degrees and, 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 and uh, um, you know, how tolerant you are. When we won the league in 93, yeah. um, my dad said to me, he can stay for life now. I didn't quite understand that at the time, but it's something that I've always took with me watching football since. Like when Leicester sat Ranieri and you're like, hang on, yeah. he won the league with Leicester. Yeah. The guy should be allowed to take them down to the second level if he wants to, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So that statement from my dad, yeah. did that ring true for you guys? Once he's uh, won a league, that's that. I, well, I think, I think once he won the league, don't forget, we've gone 26 years without winning the league. Um, and it, it was absolutely huge. And all I will say is that he had a, a, a lot of points in the bag. <laughs> when, when he won that league, it would, it, you know, he, it, it, yeah, he'd bought himself a lot of time. I think. Yeah. You think that there'd but, be? But it, but it never arose because we won the league that year. Then we go and do the double the next year. Only miss out because of Cantona in '95. We, we could have won five or six in the bounce. I think we would have done the double again in '95. Yeah. Cantona hadn't been injured, so you know, and so it goes on. So that never arose. But but I think that having won that league, it would have been quite some time. He'd have had. He'd have had to have limited success for quite some time mm. before any move was made to remove him. Good, because I think that it should be. That you, I don't like the Chelsea model of you win a double like Ancelotti's done and you're out the door, or yeah. you win a European Cup and you're out the door. It doesn't sit right with me that. Even City have done it recently with yeah. league winning managers. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like that. Yeah. Um, around obviously the time of the perceived troubles with Fergie, there was the Michael Knighton takeover, yeah. famously doing kick-ups on the pitch and stuff like that. Yeah. What did he see in the club's accounts which made his investors pull out? I don't know. I was never party to that. Uh, all I know is that, that, that the money was there at one stage, because obviously we had the due diligence and all the rest of it, and when he made the, the offer to buy my shares, he had to prove that the money was there. And at one stage it was there, and I know he had two backers. They eventually pulled out. The reasons, I don't know. I suspect that they probably wanted more power than, in the running of the club that Michael Knighton was prepared to give them. That's my suspicion. But I can't say for definite because he, uh, he'd need to confirm that. But there was <clears> something that went wrong between him and, and his backers. He always maintained that he had other backers there. But I think the longer it went on, and once that, that he'd actually um, used um, inside information, club statistics and inside information, once he, he'd sort of used those as a selling tool, that's when we all stepped in and said, right, enough's enough now. It's not happening the way we thought it was going to happen. And that's when we asked him to withdraw his, his offer. And he did. But in doing that, we, we, we offered him a place on the board. Uh, and he was looking at buy the club for £10 million. Pound. He was looking, yeah. Well, it would have cost, the, the whole deal would have cost him £30 million. He wanted to buy my shares for £10 million. That means that if he wanted to buy the, buy, buy the club, he'd have had to offer the other shares, because I had 50%. Mm. He'd have had to have offered the same price to the other shareholders to get 100% control. That would have cost him another 10 million. But the real reason for me doing it was the fact that he said that if he buys my shares, part of the deal would be that he would build the Stratford. 
Okay. And, and, he, and the strip for him was going to cost 10 million. That was the real attraction. Not just the, the 10 million for the shares, because somebody else might have been prepared to pay the 10 million for the shares. But how was I going to build the strip at the time, 1989? We hadn't got the money. Mm. We hadn't got 10 million in the bank to build the strip for end. All the money we were generating at the time was going on buying players or trying to improve the team. It feels like such a inconsequential amount, obviously it's still a significant amount of money, but it feels like such an inconsequential amount when you think of the, you know, we would buy an average player for... Well, it, it, it does now, yeah. but at the time, the 10 million to build the strip <clears> down was, a, was, a, was a, a huge, huge burden. Is that what ended up costing in the early 90s when uh, we... I think, well, I think, in the, uh, but, but don't forget, I was always improving the ground. I think over the years, in my 20, 20 years as chief exec, or, or even 23 as chairman, I spent something like 114 million on the stadium. Well, I know from I'm, it must have been different from when you first went, but yeah. from my first game in '90, I spent a couple of years on the Stratford end, sat with my legs through the railings, early yes, doors, yeah. prior to the redevelopment, yeah. and that. Yeah. But yeah, it's changed so we much. We knew once. Then. But I mean, a lot of these things were actually forced on us by things like yeah, the Heisel report. And, and the ta- well, the Taylor report, yeah, but, <clears> but they were a uh, result of Heisel and the Bradford fire and uh, subsequently Hillsborough. So of course the Taylor report came in, and then uh, the Popplewell and all the rest of it, and then, then the, the Act, where you had to, we had to go all seater. Once we had to go all seater, you couldn't just put seats on the Stratford end mm. on, 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 on Saturday. We had to knock the stand down and rebuild. That's why it was ten million rather than just uh, a few million. Mm. You know what I mean? And then once we decided to do that, we then thought, well, if we're going to have to build, spend ten million, we might as well put, get some money back on boxes and exec seats in that stand, which of course, again, wasn't popular, mm. but it was something we, we felt we had, we had to do. So, um, the night and takeover doesn't happen. 1991, you floated the club. Well, we floated the club. If night had happened, obviously we wouldn't have needed to float. Yeah. We floated because we st- it was still there. To, to rebuild the Stratford end still had to be addressed. Mm. And it, 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 so it, there's two ways of doing it. You either get a private individual in who's prepared to spend the money on it, uh, or you do, or you float and raise the money through the float. Do you think uh, the flow helped? The float in combination with the the sky money that came in with the advent of the Premier League really helped United set a dominance in the, the early nineties. Or do you think it was a lot down to no. what was already in place? Well, I think I think I think I, I think I think it's a, a number of combinations. Uh, I think one is that that we we spent on the team. The team was improving. Don't forget the first year, don't forget that when we floated, the year we floated, we won the European Cup Winners' Cup. We won the FA Cup before, we won the Cup Winners' Cup. We, the, the following year, we should have won the league. We just missed out to leave. Four games in four days. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. It, it wouldn't happen now. Well, I don't was, think it would It, it was horrendous. Right? <clears throat> we lost out to Leeds. Then the next year, we actually won the, won the league. We won the league the first year of the Premier League. The Premier League was huge because the Premier League then allowed the Premier League to take it, to take the TV income that it generated. It allowed it. I don't understand what. Because I know it was a rebranding. I get it was a rebranding, but there was nothing different from it being a first division instead of Premier League. In not in t- not in terms of the number of the the same number of clubs and the same qualification, but don't forget once the Premier League started and Sky came in and Sky and don't forget, you see before that all the ninety two clubs shared the same income. From right. television, we all got £25,000 each. Manchester United got £25,000. No matter how many times it appeared on television, it got the same as Rochdale. That can't have been right. So once we set up the Premier League, the income that the Premier League generated went to the Premier League clubs, both in terms of sponsorship and television income. See, that's the key factor then, isn't it? That's, that key, allowed that's the key factor, yeah. Separate negotiations. Yeah, separate negotiations. And of course, the... The, the sky coming in and almost devoting their channel to, to football, to sport and football. Football was the driver for them. So they were prepared to pay a lot of money because they wanted subscriptions. They wanted, the football subscription was the biggest driver. So they were prepared to pay more money. And that just coincided with Manchester United winning the, uh, the first Premier League and then winning it again, and then going on winning it eight times in 11 years and all the rest of it. We. You know, we we'd fortunately started building the team before that. The team was coming to fruition. It was about to become successful. The Premier League, we did the float. We raised the money for the, the Stratford end. We then, the Premier League starts, 
And just as the Premier League starts, Manchester United is coming to its, its peak after 20 odd years in the darkness. In, 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 the wilderness, <laughs> in the wilderness. So the combination, the timing and the combination was just right. And then once, once then Sky came in, uh, started to promote the game, then the overseas got bigger and bigger, and, and, and United then became the biggest football attraction in the world, really. That's why so many overseas countries take it. You see the value of the overseas today, oh, three billion. Yeah, no. or the, the money that Sky TV are paying for it's TV it's rights. It's, yeah, but did you ever envisage it being like that? No, no, no. <laughs> Nothing but close. I found the members. I mean, there's five, five of us started the Premier League. Five of us. So, um, and, and that Premier League to start, we started in 83. There were various negotiations along the way where we started to win a few things, like keeping your home gates, uh, changing the, the, the balance of the TV money, it's getting a bit more... Keeping your home gates? Or do you used to have to share... We used to, we used to, we used to share the home gates at one stage. In the league? Or, or you had to pay a large, or you, you had, used to pay a percentage of it to the uh, opposition, whereas when it then changed that you can kept your home gate. So when we, like, when, we, when, we, when we went to Tottenham at one time, we shared the home gate at Tottenham, and when we went there, we shared it with them. Wow. And when they came to us... Didn't know that, never no, heard of that. No, 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 that's right. So that all changed. So there was various negotiations along the way, but then the st uh, it took us nine years to get the Premier League started. We started in '83, and in '92 it was up and running. There was always talk of um, the European Super League. Yeah. Um, what would that have looked like? Well, we, we uh, there's a lot of what should we say? A lot of talk at the time about the European Super League. What what did that mean? I mean. We were never interested in breaking away from our traditional home fixtures. Let's say the old First Division or the, or the Premier League. Mm -hmm. The European Super League was, was 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 if anything was going to be was a midweek league. It was never going to never going to replace so the Champions League. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And as a result of all the talk about breakaways and everything else, and countries not being happy, the Champions League was formed. That then took away any threat of a permanent midweek league. Hmm, interesting. But, we, but, we, but there was never, it was never in Manchester United's interest then, and I don't believe it is today, to break away from the Premier no, League. No, no, you, 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 need, you need those you local You need your fixtures. traditional fixtures, you know. I mean, Manchester United against Everton or, or it, it will always be bigger than, say, Manchester United against Anderlecht or whatever. OK, Barcelona, Real Madrid, huge games. huge games. But the rest of it, they'd rather have the uh, tradition of the local rivalry or, or whatever. And, and once you break that, you, you, you've got big problems. Do you ever envisage a time where we could see uh, an evolution of the European Champions League to a World Champions League, where we could see MLS teams, Brazilian teams, African teams? I don't think that you need to do that, because if, 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 you, lo if you look at it, the, the two strongest leagues in the world is the South American League and, the, uh, and Europe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And they play off the winners of Europe every year. Well, well you've now got the World Club Championship, which now embraces all the continents. I don't see, that with all the travel and all the rest of it, I mean, you, the, you, Europe's the biggest. I mean, South America, Europe's much bigger than South America in mm. terms of income. And oh, yeah, they can't crowds compete. And everything else. They, Wouldn't they, it be good if, if when Neymar's next transfer comes up, Santos are in the mix as well as Manchester yeah, City? Wouldn't yeah, it be brilliant yeah, if we had yeah, a, a level-ish yeah, playing field? It doesn't because world. the wealth is in, 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 in Europe. So I don't see it. I, th I, think, I think what you've got at the moment is fantastic. Mm. You've got your National League, the Premier League, which is the most successful financially, the most successful league in the world. It also attracts fantastic players, doesn't it? Worldwide players, you know, from South America, from everywhere, Asia, everywhere, the best mm. players. And then you've got the European uh, Champions League as well, which you, you four, four clubs are competing in that, which is a lot different from the old days when only the Champions yeah. went in. So yeah. it's all... It's all changed, has not it? Um, let's talk about transfers then. We just sort of touched on transfers there. Eric Cantona is my favourite player of all time. Yeah. Um, how did that transfer come about? Because it seems like such a yeah. an opportunistic transfer. Well, it was. It was. It was just. It was really out of the blue, very very quick. Um, the Bill Fotherby was the Leeds United chief exec, and he rang me one day in the office and just said that uh, uh, Howard Wilkinson wanted to buy Dennis Irwin. Would would be interested in selling. And I said, well, I'll have a word with Alec. I said, but I don't think so. I think, you know, 
did he say something off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, I said, uh, and, and, and I said, but would you be prepared? Because I'd heard that Howard and Eric didn't get on very well. I mean, it was well publicised, wasn't yeah. it? There was always, you know, would you be prepared to sell Eric Cantona? I said, well, let me, uh, let me find out. So next day he came on about Dennis. And uh, I, I spoke, I, in the meantime, I'd rung Alec at the training house. I said, look, you know, Leeds have been on for Dennis Irwin and all the rest of it. He said, no, 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 no chance, no chance. I said, if I can get Cantona, would you take him? He said, too right. So next day, Bill Fotherby rings up and says that, you know, inquires about Dennis. I said, absolutely no way. I said, but we'll take Eric off your hands, prepared to sell. And he said, well, he said, yeah, we would be prepared to do it. He said, but we'd have to do it very, very quickly. He said, because they, the supporters here love him. He said, and we'll get lynched. So he said, so if we can do it very quickly and agree a price, we'll do it. So he said, what are you prepared to pay? So I said, a million. So, no, no, we can't do it that. He said, uh, 1.6. So we argued and argued. I kept on saying, look, you know, we're doing you a favour, we're taking it. <laughs> so in the end, he said, he said, OK, he said, but can we say it's 1.6? That's what was interesting was the PR, you know what I mean? So he said, can we say it's 1.6? I said, you can say what it's like. I said, and we can do it as quickly as you want. That's, that's how it happened. Joel Cantona's press conference. I had my ninth birthday party at Old Trafford the same day and I couldn't do the full tour really? because of the press office, the press room was part of the tour right, right. and uh, Cantona was being signed in there yeah, at the yeah. time I was having my ninth birthday party. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, so some of those other, I mean obviously that was the bargain of the millennium, unbelievable yeah. signing, uh, what a catalyst for Manchester United, it changed the way we played and arguably changed the way a lot of teams employed uh, a second striker and number 10, yeah. going from 4-4-2 to someone in between the lines a little bit, brilliant footballer, yeah. massively underrated I think by yeah. you know, people who just look at stats because he wasn't prolific really was he? I try and explain well, to well, my son well, how good he was. Bad, you know, I think he got 80 odd goals in something like 180 games. Which is not, it's nearly one, nearly one it's, in It's two. not bad now, but it's, when you look at what Ronaldo and Messi, etc. are doing, a yeah, goal a game, it's... It's nearly one in two, yeah, but I don't think Ronaldo and Messi would be, be scoring quite as prolifically as they did in the Premier League. Oh, no, I'm Do sure. You? I just don't. I think that when they, you know, when, when they play each other or you bring Atletico Madrid in, it's a different matter, but some of the other teams there... Yeah, they're quite you know, poor. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but they, they are two unbelievable players. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. possibly in the top. Yeah. Three of all time, yeah. the pair of them, I think. I, yeah. I, I was interested in the program last night. Did you see Eusebio's record? Uh, no, but he's got over six hundred goals, I think. No, no. Well, no, he played for um, Benfica, four hundred and forty goal games, four hundred and seventy-three goals. Yeah, I think he's, with his international caps, I think he's he's over five hundred. Oh, he could yeah. well be. Could well be. Oh, he would be. Yeah, yeah. That was just for. That was just oh, for uh, look Benfica. at Gerd Muller's and Romario. Romario's well, well, Gerd on Muller got something like sixty-three goals in fifty-six games for. What better than one in one? And I noticed the other day I was reading about Pushkas, 84, 85 games for Hungary, eighty four goals. You know what I mean? So th th there's been some great strikes. Unbelievable strikes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, Ronaldo and Messi's record is is utterly ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about because for me that obviously is when I was really growing up. That nineties yeah. era was such yeah. a golden age of yeah. of football. We used to watch Italian football on telly on a Sunday, and yeah. and uh, it was it was brilliant. Now we was always linked with Batistuta. Please tell me there was some truth in. That. Yeah, Batty's tutor was probably, if somebody said to me, the one player that probably I didn't support Alec on was Batty's tutor. Oh, really? Yeah, not, it was not, not to do with the transfer fee, it was purely to do with the personal terms. Oh. But I, I, I was given the personal terms and they were, I, I can't remember what it was now, but whatever it was, it was net. And by the time you grossed it up, it was like, it would have absolutely shattered our wage bill at the time. And we had some good players at the time. You know, and, and if we'd taken Battis Tutor on, because what happens with football is you bring a footballer in, his wages soon get down, and all the top players want the same. They say, well, I'm as good as him, and the and all the rest of it. And at the time of Battis Tutor, I was trying to keep, <laughs> I was still having to spend a lot of money on the stadium. I was trying to keep some sort of... Which year was it was in for? 95, 96 kind of exactly time? Exactly what year it was now. I just remember it was a time that we still had a lot more to do on the stadium, to complete the stadium. Because don't forget, we did the Stratford end, mm -hmm. and then we did the North Stand, and the North Stand was uh, was huge. And then, of course, we did, eventually did the East Stand. So we were still completing the stadium. We'd gone public, so we still had to pay a dividend and all the rest of it. And to be honest with you, I just didn't feel at the time that that, that, that we could f afford it. And we were still winning 
the league every year and we were still doing well in, 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 in Europe so it would have been a luxury let's put it that way probably if I hadn't got the stadium to consider we might have, might have gone for it but it was just well, might have been a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a player he was yeah, well. um, but we missed out on one or two players all for different reasons but I'd say that was probably the only one uh, financially Shearer we went for as you know yeah um, and he, I think that was Jack Walker. I don't think that, I think Shearer would have Yeah, that to seems us. to be kind of reported, Jack, doesn't it? Jack Walker that? seems to have, 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 have stopped that one you know, over my dead body. And of course, Gascoigne, we, we, we were interested in, but Tottenham. Offered him a sunbed? Yeah. <laughs> offered, offered him some last minute, some last minute <laughs> <laughs> which he, he went for. So, and of course, Lineker, we had the opportunity, but, um, you know, but that's before he really made the big time when he was still at Leicester. So all those players would have improved us at some stage along the line, but you don't get everybody. But no. we got we got the we got majority. We got quite a few. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the way structure again in a second. So Roy Keane had a, a real uh, negotiation, shall we say, to yeah. try, and he ended up breaking it, didn't he? Yes. The, yeah, the we, way we, structure we, was we broke. broke. We, we did. We did. But but it's slightly different because he was with us anyway, and we knew his importance to us because he was on board already, and we were winning things. And he was the captain, and all the rest of it. So we did break the wage structure for for for, for Roy Keane. Yeah. Original that Ronaldo. Late, yeah, that was two thousand ish. I yeah, think. Yeah. Original yeah. Ronaldo. Was we ever in in the mix for him? Uh, the, the Brazilian, Brazilian Ronaldo. Ronaldo. No, don't think so. No. All right, no. Okay. Good because I'm I'm. Yeah. I've got that from both sides now. Yeah. We've got that from um, one of my friends, Adam, spoke to Ronaldo yeah. uh, in France last year and he asked him, why didn't you ever come to United? And he said there was never room for me. Yeah. I wonder why. Don't know, don't know. Never, never came up. Yeah. Um, any, any that you think we let go too soon? Uh, well, the obvious one was Stan. Um, and I think even Alex alluded to that since. I mean, Stan was with us for what three full seasons, maybe four, and was probably the best centre half in in, in Europe was beast, wasn't at it? the time. He was huge, um, and um, I think Alec thought he was he'd had an injury, and I think Alec thought he was past his his peak, and he went on, and of course he he, he carried on playing good, good football elsewhere. So uh, I think, but I think Alex alluded to that one. That was a mistake. I also think, well, I don't, this wasn't a mistake, but if you're looking back now and saying where did United go wrong, I think when Peter Schmeichel retired, <laughs> if we got Van der Sar, at the time that Peter Schmeichel retired, I think we'd be more successful. I think we'd have won more, more honours. But that wasn't, I mean, Peter was going anyway. Mm. It was just that, 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 you know, I think Van der Sar should have been the immediate choice. Was he even in consideration at the time? Um, I don't know because no, probably not because I think Alec had made up his mind early on that um, he wanted to go for um, Bosnich and we went and, and, and uh, met Bosnich and concluded a deal with him and I think then Alec did change his mind but it was too late we shaken hands with, uh, with uh, Bosnich and uh, yeah. we went for a period of having some Pretty ordinary goalkeepers, didn't it? With Bodnitz, Taibbi, yeah. Bartes didn't quite settle. Yeah, no, uh, Tim yeah. Howard didn't really yeah. make it happen, and then obviously yeah, yeah, we bring yeah. in Van, Van der Sar. Sar. What a what a yeah. goalkeeper! Yeah. Yeah. Quite close to Schmeichel, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and Big Dave at the moment, he's pushing his record. Yeah, is is absolutely so. brilliant considering but the the well, lean well, times. The three of them are all brilliant, aren't they? All three. You know, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be sorry with any one of the three between the oh, six. Oh God, no, no. I, th I find it hard to pick between the three of them. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. about who I think is the better. Yeah. I think the guy probably suffers a little bit at the moment because he's he's current and you can't really look back on him and see his yeah. career. I think if he wins a European Cup, should he win a European Cup at United, yeah. he's, he's probably going to put himself right in that yeah, mix. Be, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about retirements. First of all, Cantona's retirement because this this hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How was that received at the club? Well, it was out of the blue. It was very sudden. I mean, we got to the end of '97. We got to the end of the season. We won the league, and he was obviously instrumental in, the, in winning the league. But that was also the year that I felt we, we should have gone on and possibly. That was Dortmund, wasn't it? Dortmund, yeah. The two semi finals. We lost them both 1 0. We had about 50 uh, shots on target across know, the two games. I know, I know, <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, that was. And, and, and now, I've always sort of believed at the back of my mind that that also had something to do with Eric's mind as well that you know what I mean that, 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 that he probably felt that that year we should have done better in, in, in do you not remember him when he came out to collect the trophy we had those purple drill tops yeah, on yeah. 
He was standing behind, they had those shutters, some Carlin shutters. Yeah. He was standing behind the Carlin shutters and he looked like he wanted to be anywhere else in the world well, apart from... Well, he's made up his mind by then, hasn't he? Yeah. There was also times, I think we'd scored goals in those last couple of games yeah. and he barely got back to the halfway line, looking around at all the trickle or flags with his face yeah. on and yeah. he was definitely soaking it yeah. in, I think. Yeah, I think he made up his mind by then that, 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 that this was going to be the last year. But it was still a big shock and he came to see me first. I had to ring Alec and <laughs> tell him. Tell him, he came to see me to say that he wanted to call it a day, and it was quite obvious that he wasn't he, he wasn't in a mood to be persuaded. You know what I mean? He said, "Look, I'm going," even to the extent that he said, "I don't want this to be announced till I'm on holiday," and he said, "I'm going away on such and such a date." He said, um, I, "I'd like it to be announced while I'm away. I don't want all the fuss and all the hassle of people trying to persuade." Came at the airport and, and, and stuff. Yeah, the, all the rest. Of it. He said, "I don't want any of that." He said, and I, now, and he said, I want to, to say, he came out with a statement about how this has been the highlight of his life and how much he enjoyed playing for the club and all the rest of it. And he gave us a statement that he wanted to come out while he was uh, away. Wow. Well, you know, so we knew there was no, no way of dissuading him. So he was 31 and it was a big, big shock because we'd not even thought about replacements or yeah. who, who, who can you get in to replace Eric. I mean, as it happened, it turned out to be showing. And there was a bit of luck with that. You know the story there, don't you? With how he came about? How the, yeah. No, I don't know. Well, um, have you not read the book yet? No, I didn't get my copy. Oh, Sue's right? not sorted me out my oh, copy yet, right? no. Well, what happened there was, um, two years before, when Eric had kicked, in 95, when Eric had kicked the uh, Crystal Palace supporter, Eric said that he was leaving, he was leaving English football. When he got yes, sent, I, I do remember he, that, he yeah, said he was. he was going. And at the time, Brian Kidd had said to me, not Alec, but Brian Kidd just had said, by the way, he said, uh, if, uh, we, we, if Eric doesn't re-sign, we should be thinking in terms of showing him as a replacement. And uh, then of course, Eric did <laughs> re-sign the rest of it. But with Brian Kidd saying that to me, the next meeting in London, I'd said to Alan Sugar, if ever you sell Sheringham, we'd be interested. It's on the back of that, yeah. thinking Eric might be going the rest of it. I said, would you, give me, would you give us first option? He said, yeah, I will. And then two years later, I'm sitting in my office. Eric's gone. I'm sitting in my office one night, one evening. The phone goes, Alan Sugar. Martin, Alan Sugar. Yeah, yeah, what the hell are you on? He said, do you remember that conversation when two years ago? He said, well, we want to get rid of him, Shay. So I said, well, what do you want for him, Alan? He said, oh, 3.5. Done. I said, I'll come back to you, because I didn't know when Alec wanted him. I'd never had the conversation with Shay All right. about Shay with Alec. I had with Kim, but not with Alec. So I rang Alec and said, Alec, um, I had Alan Sugar on the phone. Uh, they're going to sell Sheringham. 3.5 million, what do you think? Bloody hell, he said, that's a struggle. He said, you could be, you could be Eric's replacement. <laughs> so I rang Alan Sugar back and said, look, yeah, well, yeah we're interested, Alan. Well, 3.5 is a bit strong. Well, you know, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the full glass. Pay 3.5 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anybody, anybody will take him out. So, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pay it then. We'll pay it. You know what I mean? So uh, I tried, tried it on, but it didn't work. So, so we paid the 3.5. That's how we got showing. And obviously played a massive part yeah. uh, in well, what was, you know, is constantly referred to now as you've got to have four top class strikers, yeah, but yeah. I'm not sure how often that really works. But I mean, he came in and then, then of course the first year we won nothing, mm -hmm. that was the uh, the 98 season, we won nothing. But then the following year we did the treble, we yep. sharing a big part of it, and then we win the league the next two years with sharing a big part of it. So. He won three like three leagues in three years. He yeah, travel, so hell of a player. He, he was, he was yeah, very, very helpful. I think he's only, I think he's only just finished playing about a fortnight ago. <laughs> actually, he's, he played. He had a record, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Uh, so the other retirement that we have to talk about is Sir Alex's nearly retirement. Yeah. Um, I have seen an excerpt from the book where you mentioned Wenger was interested in the job. Well, no. Well, we were interested in Wenger. Okay. Um, when we knew when we Alec uh, tendered his resignation in two thousand and two, uh, we obviously had to. Think of a replacement, and our choice was um, Wenger. He was the number one choice. He was the number one choice, yeah. And Peter Kenyon and I, I stepped down as chief, uh, chief exec, but I was chairman, still chairman of the football club. Um, and Peter was chief exec. And we had a couple of meetings with Arsene Wenger, one at his home in London and one in Paris. And he showed a bit of initial interest, 
But then in the end, uh, he turned it down. He said the reason he gave was that uh, he'd started something at Arsenal. Uh, he felt a loyalty to them, uh, and particularly David Dean, who he was very close to, and he didn't want to, he'd, he'd thought about it, he didn't want to let them down, so he was going to stay, stay at Arsenal. Sven was also rumoured to be in Sven lined was, up. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I have to be honest here, I was less keen most personally on Sven, although I was still chairman of the football club. Uh, the PLC board was, was in operation, and Peter had persuaded the other members of the PLC board that Sven was the one that he wanted, and as chief exec, he obviously carried a lot of weight. Mm. Um, I, did, I wasn't involved in that negotiation at all. Peter was, and had agreed terms with Sven. So Sven would have replaced Sven, Sir Alex Sven if he actually walked away. Sir Alec. But what happened was that Alec changed his mind, and uh, Sven got let down, really. <laughs> but was again was there a shortlist there, or was that I, from I, Wenger to well, Sven? Well, no, and I think I think that, that, that it was it was uh, uh, Wenger to Sven. Yeah, I don't think there was any other shortlist. Because I look at the situation we're in at the moment, and I personally believe we need somebody like a director of football at the club to oversee a longer term philosophy because it feels like we're entering a period of changing a manager frequently, which I don't like. Yeah. I would love to see somebody build a dynasty. I don't care if that's unrealistic. Yeah. Football's naturally romantic, isn't it? And I yeah. would like us to do yeah. another dynasty like Sir Alex did. Yeah. Do you think United have gone about replacing him the correct way? Because to me, even Mourinho felt like opportunistic. It didn't feel like it was a planned appointment. It's difficult for me to say. Um, I'm sure you, I'm, I'm top president of the uh, uh, you know, I enjoy the role and all the rest of it. What is your role at the moment then, as uh, president just, of the club? Just purely honorary, purely honorary. I, you know, I, I, it's a nice position to be in because I, I can go to all the games, I can go to the dressing room and what. If I wanted to, they always invite me at like the finals and things, or you know, as, 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 as part of it, as one of the guests. So it's just a very, very uh, privileged role. Cushy little job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't call it a job. It's not remunerated, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's very nice. It's, you know what I mean? And. Uh, you know, I get I get to see the, see people and, and talk and socialise, and, and uh, I can go and watch the games in peace. We spoke briefly about uh, the Benfica game uh, yeah. just earlier. Uh, there is an element of impatience creeping in in the crowd. Yeah. Why do you think that is, and and do you? Because I don't agree with it. But you must have obviously with someone who had the patience you had with Sir Alex. You must. It must be pulling your hair out. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that there is a difference. I mean, I mean. Uh, Mourinho has never had the reputation necessarily of, of being which, which was a, uh, an attacking manager, even with Chelsea. And he's a successful manager, he wins trophies, but even even the Chelsea sides, I wouldn't describe them as, as exciting, even at the, even when they were mm. at their peak and winning winning trophies. But he is a manager who knows how to, wi how to win. I mean, even last year, some of the football at Old Trafford, I wouldn't say was vastly exciting at home. You know, some of, some of it was quite, quite ordinary, but he comes away with two trophies at the end of the season, the League Cup and the European, and that was a, that was a hard slog, that oh European yeah. Cup. I mean, it was seven home games, seven away games, all, you know, fairly tragic. You know, oh, we played in a car park in Rostov, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, and I thought he did it exceptionally well with his tactics in the final. Oh, there, there was no event. There was a non-event. There was, it, it was never in it. Exactly. So, there never, so he does know how to win, um, but uh, he wins in a certain style. And, and it's probably not the style that a lot of United supporters are used to. It's not the style, say, of Samat or Tommy Dock or Ron Atkinson or Alec Ferguson. But it is a, he does win. He wins trophies. He's successful. People so are forgetting these four nils we've had already this season. Yeah, we, we have started this season very yeah. well. We did start, start the season very well. But then we go and park the bus at, at Liverpool. I think a lot of people felt that at Liverpool we should have gone out to, to win and that they, 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 they were vulnerable. And that was the one to, to go for. But, you know what I mean? I think it's early days. He's had one season, he's won two trophies, he's got us in the Champions League. I, I, I think, you know, he deserves every, every chance now. Let's, let's, let's judge him over a longer period of, 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 of time. You just mentioned Samat there, actually, and I did mean to speak to you earlier on when I was talking about, about Samat, because a lot of what Samat has done has been eclipsed by Sir Alex's achievements at the club. Yeah. But would we wouldn't have a club of this size no. without Samat. No. Can yeah. for a lot of my audience is fairly young. Can you give us some of your experiences with Samat? Well, d don't forget, before Samat was appointed, United in the in the thirties before the war was a pretty ordinary 
football club. We, United's best period before Sir Matt was in 1908-1911, where we won two leagues and a cup. Apart from that, you know, United's history wasn't particularly exciting. So suddenly Matt's appointed in 1945, and very similar length of tenure to Alec, he did something like 24 years of manage, managing the club. Uh, at a difficult time, you know, picking up the pieces after the war, uh, I think he was running up four times in the first five leagues after the war, then he wins it in 52, and then of course he produces that great side in 56, 57, the Busby Babes. And who knows what that side would have gone on to, to achieve. It won two leagues, it was uh, uh, challenging Real Madrid in, in, in Europe for the European Cup. The average age was something like 23, <laughs> yeah, something like nothing. that. Very young age, lots of fantastic players players that would have gone on to dominate football for years to come, suddenly destroyed at Muni. So he has to start again. So he starts again, having lost eight players killed, two never played again, one or two who weren't the same again. What, do you, what does he do? He starts again. He builds a side up that wins the FA Cup in style in 63, wins the league in 65, wins the league again in 67, and wins the European Cup. 68. Ten years for ten a total years, rebuild. Ten years after Munich, he builds a side that wins the European Cup. That put Manchester United on the map. So, I mean, to me, Manchester United, you can't mention Manchester United without Busby. He is absolutely essential to the whole history of the, of the club. He was an absolute giant. Can you describe what it was like watching the babes? Did you know you was watching something I, I, special? I, I didn't. I... I, I I saw the Babes, well I didn't see the Babes because I, I watched United before the Babes and then I started watching United regularly after the crash, so in 1958. So I don't remember seeing the Babes, I've read new, all s stories about them and they were just a ph phenomenal football team. There's an excellent book by James Layton called The Greatest because yeah. he says quite often when people are, are killed or die young there's a bit of a memorialising about them and people inflate how good they was so he goes let's cut through the rubbish yeah. and he goes to the source material of the newspapers of the time yeah. to find out exactly how Duncan Edwards is yeah. and he named his book the greatest he didn't call it the pretty good he called it the greatest yes. and it sounds like Duncan Edwards was just Everybody, something unbelievable yeah. Saw him, yeah. yeah yeah his build his, his uh, attitude just everything about him football mad uh, uh, fit as a fiddle uh, powerful uh, every attribute, you know, strong, could pass, could tackle, could head, uh, you know, could play anywhere, midfield, defence, up front if you wanted him to, could turn a game, uh, just a phenomenal football. When you think Manchester United, what's the first image that comes to your head? When I think of Manchester United, I'd probably Ultra. Is there a better football club in the world? Not for me. Not for me either. <laughs> um, okay, Martin, you've got a book coming out. Um, uh, what is the title? It's called uh, Red Glory, uh, Manchester United and Me. Why should Manchester United fans be buying this? Well, it's, it's unique in the sense that, that footballers write books, managers write books, not many owners or chairmen write books, um, partly because uh, they're not there long enough or maybe they haven't got the success of the club behind them that would create an interest. I was fortunate in the sense that my father was chairman before me. He came on the board the day after the Munich air crash so, and then he became chairman in 1965. He was 65 to 80. I was 80 to 2003. So it takes in from 58 to 2003 the club history from the inside. Wow, I mean... It's quite a lot happened in that a time. Lot's quite a lot a happened lot of in that managers, time. Lots of different players. Uh, so you know, just an exciting, exciting history. And also, you know, major decisions from the boardroom point of view. Or from, you know, I mean, you mentioned one or two earlier on. You mentioned Knighton and decisions like that. You know what I mean? So, um, why did you make that decision? You know, um, so, the B Sky B deal. You know, uh, the float. Uh, why did we buy a certain place? Yeah, it's just it's just from the inside, really. Make sure you go and get it, Martin. Thank you very much for joining thank me. It's been fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant.